and spoken at dreaming conferences up to this point. I don't normally uh, do my own introductions, but this is my first ever talk at a Moisture event. And so along with that comes the realization that I feel like a total imposter. <laughs> I got into programming because I like playing video games. That's actually me. I started programming at the age of six. Now, naturally, I ended up majoring in computer science in college. Anyone else out there who did the computer science thing? Yeah, a whole lot of you. That's great, good for you, that's very cool. Uh, so I ended up taking a somewhat different uh, route to a career in programming. Um, I dropped out to go full time in a tech, tech support job at MISP with the hopes of working my way up from there. See, I heard there was soon going to be uh, openings in systems administration, and I wanted one of those jobs because I, I figured I could probably start getting paid with that code. So I landed that sysadmin job, and so it probably is not terribly surprising to folks that have been doing systems administration before that the first programming language I got paid to write was Perl. This is a real program, it runs. I wrote other languages in the meantime, uh, but when I found Ruby, it was a natural transition for me. Uh, especially since people were starting to take that whole Rails thing kind of seriously, and I, I felt like I was finally going to be able to pretend to be a, a respectable programmer. But functional programming? <laughs> functional programming still felt like the domain of people that were smarter than me, you know, people who actually completed their CS degree. And then this guy came along, and everything changed for me. Now, I'm a bit later to the party than some of you. I only tried Elixir for the first time back in April of 2014 when 0.13 dropped. But when I did, an amazing thing happened to me. And I discovered that FP wasn't as scary as I thought. I didn't have any real projects that I could use Elixir on just yet, but I was keeping my eye on them. Then, over a year later, uh, this tweet showed up in my timeline. A friend had prodded me to submit a talk to a conference called Get Ruby Weird. And after I responded to him with my concerns about preparation time, he responded with what I can only assume is the conference organizer equivalent of a car salesperson. Let's just take it for a test drive, no obligation. Now, Terrence knew exactly what talk I wanted to build, and he knew that I found the idea pretty scary. See, I'd opened my big mouth uh, a few months earlier at RailsCon about this idea that I had to build a choose-your-own-adventure talk where the audience could vote on what we talked about as we went along. Now, I knew telling someone about this was going to put me in this awkward situation. <laughs> the problem was I had no idea how I was actually going to build this talk. I spent most of my programming career writing web applications, and this thing was more like a multiplayer network-driven game than a presentation application. Not that the distinction really mattered, because I've never been to either of those things. So I gave up, and I wrote a proposal anyway. But even as a proposal, I tried to talk them into accepting it. Unfortunately, they accepted it anyway. So before I accepted the invitation, I spent some time that weekend hacking together this incredible tech demo that you see before you, using Elixir, Phoenix, and React. I wanted to make sure that a bare minimum I could get a presenter, uh, desktop client, and mobile client all synced up. Okay, obviously had a, a very long way to go. But that being said, it felt almost too easy. Now, I always tell people that they can judge a technology by the things that it makes feel like cheating when they use it. So I must have chosen the right technology, right? But in the back of my mind, I was worried that Maybe I really was cheating somehow, and I just didn't know it yet, and it was going to show up once I got further in. There's no way it could, could really have been this easy. So, I had eight weeks to try to turn my simple demo into a full-fledged presentation application in my spare time, and also build many more slides than ever would be seen, because that's the nature of Choose Your Own Adventure. For a talk of a type I've never written before, using a tool chain that has, in this very moment, uh, only barely existed. Oh, and it had to keep running under the load of a room full of developers who I just knew were going to try to break it. No big deal. Uh, just kidding. That was, a, that was a very big deal to me. I was really super stressed out. And uh, if it didn't work out, I was going to feel like I could lie to my friends. Although, to be fair, as a software developer, 
I should be used to it. After all, we're kind of in the business of life. Now, I should stop here to say that I realize that there has to be intent in order for something to be a lie. And you might say, wait a minute, you know, when I estimate, I'm not intentionally deceiving anybody. I make my best effort to give an accurate estimate. Alright, so here's a best case scenario for estimation. You pick some work off a hue, um, you start working on it. And once you've gotten into the work a bit, someone comes along and they ask you, how long do you think it's going to take you to build that thing you're working on? Now, you might have some general idea because you've just started working on it, but you can't really say for sure. And more often than not, someone's asking you that question before you've even started to, to dig into the work again. So, you basically make something up. You might even have learned it's best to add things a little bit, uh, because someone's going to hold you to that estimate, and you want to make sure that you're going to hit it. Maybe you're sitting there saying, well, not in my shop. We're enlightened. We're, we're agile. We know better than to give estimates in units of time. No, my team estimates in points. Points. Uh, the, the joys of stopping the RV. So, so the idea with points is that you don't estimate how long it's going to take, but how difficult it will be relative to other things. Right? And everyone agrees to kind of pretend that you're not really thinking about how long it's going to take you when you set a point value. Anyway, no. When you estimate, even if you're not intentionally misleading someone about how long it's going to take or how hard it's going to be, you're lying to yourself. Uh, you're telling yourself that you're going to be able to accurately predict when you're going to finish this task. And you're telling yourself basically that, that you can predict the future. And I hope that this isn't news to you. You can't. You can't predict the future. So we're going to come back to this uh, in a little bit, but right now I want to move on to something else. Git commit histories are another area where we tend to be, let's just say, flexible in our definition of the truth. Now, what is Git? Well, it's a distributed version control system, sure. But what is a version control system? It's a tool that's primarily concerned with keeping track of history, as in a record of the stuff that happened in the past, the immutable record of all that's happened thus far. So if you're setting out to change the past, you're probably going to fall into one of these two categories. Maybe you're learning to fly, and your stuff always, always gotten screwed up, and you're just, you're just a good guy. You're just trying to set things right in the past to ensure the correct version of the present. Or maybe you're the original Terminator, subservient to the will of the machines, um, working to ensure their rise and humanity's doom. Whatever you're doing, uh, whether it's by choice or, or by your programming, it's irrelevant. Now, from the point of view of an altered timeline, it's impossible to know that history was changed, let alone whether that change was for good or evil. That information is just not there. Maybe you think that's an unfair analogy. So let's look at it another way. You know how Git is implemented? It uses a hash tree. Sometimes it's called a purple tree. And what are purple trees used for? Well, let's ask Wikipedia. Apparently, they're for verification of data shared between multiple computers. And more specifically, Notice the underlying bit. They're going to ensure that nobody is lying. So we've got this incredibly powerful tool based on algorithms that are designed to make sure nobody is lying. And what's the first thing that we do with this tool? We lie to it. <laughs> we lie to it a lot. I mean, look, I understand there are a lot of Git workflows that can work really well. There are situations where these demands are totally reasonable, maybe even advisable. But lots of them are just plain abusive. People usually tell me this abuse is justified because they want their commit logs to be clean so that they tell a story. I agree, I'm a big fan of commit logs that tell a story. It's just that I prefer the story be nonfiction. It's, it's valuable to know exactly how things got to the way they were. It's valuable to know even unflattering or confusing details. It's nice to know what we tried before, you know, we landed on a solution that actually worked. If we can learn from history, so the saying goes, we might make fewer mistakes. Look at it another way. Every time you have to force push to a remote, Git is telling you you're lying to me, and you're telling it, I know, but trust me, this is for your own good. I hope you're really sure of that. Maybe we can be forgiven, though, for lying to the reason. After all, we're surrounded by lies. 
Every abstraction is a lie and it's an abstraction at all. It's a deliberate attempt to represent something in a way that's more pleasant to work with rather than how things really are underneath. As an industry, we built an impressive tower of abstractions. We built a tower of lies. And we do our work atop this tower. Every story in this tower is one that someone thought was a lie worth telling for our own good, based on their opinions. Now, if you know me, you might know that I have some opinions of my own about some of these lies. Actually, scratch opinions. I have feelings about some of those lies. But feelings are hard. So let's talk about something simpler. Science. Specifically, quantum mechanics. Much simpler than Jesus. Uh, anyone here know what this equation is? Right? Oh, there's like one hand up. Okay, for the people that aren't young, uh, for those of us who, like me, didn't immediately recognize this formula on site, let's start with something simple. Does anybody know what this is? This is a pebble. Some people might call it a very small rock. That's what this is. And when you drop it into a still body of water, it, you see it produces little waves or little ripples. If you drop two pebbles next to each other, you'll get two sets of waves, and those ripples make a kind of pattern where they intersect. Way back in 1678, a guy named Christian Hawkins is how you pronounce that. I know it doesn't look like that. There's some hard names in this. Uh, was telling people that he thought light was going a wave, just like those ripples. Now, he published this idea in 1690 in his treatise on light. But waves need to be on something or in something. So light was a wave in what exactly? He called this hypothetical substance that the waves were in the luminiferous ether, and yes, that would make a great name for a rock band. The problem for Hawkins was this guy. Maybe you've heard of him. It's kind of a big deal. And Newton also wrote his own treatise on light, in which he claimed light was a part of it. And since Newton was a bigger deal than Hawkins, uh, nobody paid much attention to him. However, there were some scientists who thought Newton was wrong. And in the beginning of the 1800s, Thomas Young, delivered a series of lectures to the Royal Society outlining a wave theory of light and adding to it a new fundamental concept that he called the principle of interference. This is a sketch that Young drew. Uh, it was based on observations of water ripples. It showed how ripples from one source uh, allowed to pass through two openings on the A and B on the left end. It created those same patterns, those uh, patterns that we saw earlier in the picture of the ripples. Now, these are called interference patterns, uh, where two waves intersect, uh, they're both in an up or a down position, they produce constructive interference, they make the wave higher or deeper. Uh, if they intersect when they're in opposing positions, they produce destructive interference, they, they flatten each other out. Now, if light was a wave, then we could expect that we might see something similar if we observe the pattern created by light shining through two openings. And in 1803, he performed this experiment, Young did now known as a double slit experiment, and saw exactly what he expected, an interference pattern. Now one of the cool things about this experiment was that it was incredibly simple to reproduce. But even a century after their origin, Newton's uh, particle theories had so much weight, so much prestige, that Young's findings didn't draw much interest. Some people even ridiculed it. Um, scientists can be a, a petty bunch, not all the programmers. <laughs> <laughs> in part, he had trouble getting traction with his idea because he was busy demonstrating real-world results instead of writing mathematical proofs. But by 1817, there was a critical mass of experiments that corroborated Young's discovery, and Newton's particle theory of light was vanquished for the time being. And classical wave theory went on to inform us and allow us to invent things like radio and radar, among other things but it still failed to explain some things. For instance, the ozone layer protects us from the short wavelength ultraviolet part of the, the sun's spectrum. But when waves pass into and out of the medium, um, their frequency reverts back to what it was originally. So if light was a wave, after it passed through the ozone layer, it would return to short wavelength, and well, we wouldn't be here to have this discussion right now, let's say it this way. So the wave theory had to be missing something, so we need to take a step back uh, to a couple of millennia ago. This cheery guy's name is Democritus. He's also known as the laughing philosopher. And he's usually credited with developing the philosophical theory of the atom. 
He called it atomism. Uh, it was in the 5th century BC. Now, he proposed that the universe was made up of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles that he called atoms, from the Greek word atomos, or indivisible. Now, philosophical atoms supposedly came in an infinite variety of shapes and sizes, and they could be combined in different ways to create everything that we see, everything that exists. This idea survived for millennia. So when chemists and natural philosophers in the 19th century found evidence uh, of tiny particles that seemed to be indivisible, they called them atoms. It was a natural choice. But it turns out that atoms didn't come in infinite varieties, or at least not so far as we know. And in fact, there are a few enough uh, that it was straightforward to maintain a table of the kinds of atoms we've discovered, and even later to predict the kinds we would discover. We call it the periodic table of the elements. Now, the other difference between atoms and their philosophical counterparts is that it turns out atoms are not individual. They are made of even smaller parts. At the end of the 19th century, J.K. Thompson, a physicist at Cambridge University, was conducting experiments with cathode ray tubing. During the course of these experiments, he discovered that cathode rays were actually streams of negatively charged particles that were about a thousand times smaller than a single atom of hydrogen. In other words, he discovered what we now call the electron. And he went on to propose that atoms were in fact divisible after all, and that electrons are the building blocks of the atom. Now, we call tiny particles, like the electron, elementary particles. And the electron was the first elementary particle we discovered, but it wouldn't be the last. Now, this is all well and good, but how does it relate to our discussions about uh, the nature of light or quantum mechanics or, hey, wasn't this talk supposed to be about abstractions? Um, well, in 1900, a theoretical physicist named Max Planck suggested that radiation is quant quantized, and that means that it comes in discrete amounts. You can have one quanta or two quanta of radiation, but you can't have one and a half quanta. Now, most scientists at the, at the time didn't take it seriously, but in 1905, Albert Einstein was one of the few scientists who did. He suggested that electromagnetic waves, of which light is one, could only exist as discrete uh, physical wave packets. He called one such wave packet the light one. Now, Einstein carefully avoided calling these wave packets particles, but still, I'll bet Isaac Newton would have felt pretty smug if they'd been around. The existence of these light forms, which we later come to call photons, was going to be confirmed 17 years later uh, by a physicist named uh, Arthur Compton. He performed an experiment to show X-rays could uh, be scattered by electrons. And if something that we knew to be a particle uh, could collide with X-rays, then it stood the reason that they must be particles as well. But wait, uh, we already just established that uh, light behaves like a wave. So which is it, a wave or a particle? So when we shine a uh, light through two slits, we see the interference pattern we expect if light is a wave. But if light is a particle, and we know it is, thanks to Einstein and Compton, uh, we should also be able to send just a single photon through those holes. This thing is a photomultiplier tool. It's a device that's so sensitive that it can, it can detect the impact of a single photon. Now if we put it in an extremely dark place, and we shine an extremely faint light through two slits, like the other experiment, we can tune things until we're only detecting a single photon at a time. And then we can check to see where those photons land. And as the photons are fired through those slits, uh, they appear to be in a random distribution at first. But if you track them over a long enough period of time, something really amazing happens. Even though the photons are arriving one at a time, the same interference pattern emerges. How is that even possible? I mean, what is it the photon is interfering with, uh, or being interfered with? The answer lies in wave functions. These are at the heart of quantum mechanics. A wave function tells us uh, the probability that a particle was going to be observed in a given position. Now, what are these waves of, or waves in? Um, we don't actually know. I hope whatever it is will have a name at least half as cool as luminiferous ether, though. Werner Heisenberg and Niels Bohr uh, were physicists who pioneered uh, the study of quantum mechanics at the University of Copenhagen in the 1920s. Their interpretation of this information of quantum mechanics is called the Copenhagen interpretation. 
And it says that the wave function doesn't have a physical nature at all. It's comprised of pure possibility. A particle traversing the double slit experiment that we talked about exists only as a wave of possible locations. And the path it took to get there is decided uh, only after we observe it. We call this uh, wave function collapse. Now prior to the collapse, it's meaningless to try to define anything about the particle. It's as though the universe is allowing all possibilities to exist simultaneously. We call this state a superposition. And the universe holds off on choosing the, uh, the last instant when we measure it. But not only that, those different paths, uh, those different possible realities, somehow interact with one another so that that interaction increases the chance that uh, some paths become real and decreases the chance that others become real. <coughs> now that interaction of possible realities is seen in the interference pattern. That pattern is real. Even if the vast majority of the paths involved in making it never become real. So in the Copenhagen interpretation, the final choice of the experiments in the universe is uh, random within the constraints of the wave function. This is a little dense, right? Sorry, we're getting somewhere into this, I promise. The theory of quantum mechanics uh, produces accurate predictions of reality and is consistent with the hope of Copenhagen interpretation, but it's not the only interpretation that can work. If you're still with me, good, because we're close to wrapping up this whole uh, science discussion, but it's going to get a little weirder before we finish up. This is Erwin Schrödinger. Now, he was an Austrian physicist. Remember this thing here? This is known as the Schrödinger equation, and it's a partial differential equation that describes how the quantum state of a system changes over time. He formulated this in 1925, and he won the 1933 Nobel Prize for Physics. Now, in the 1930s, he was following the writing and the experiments of Albert Einstein, uh, Morris Podolsky, and uh, Nathan Rose, commonly uh, just referred to as EPR. Um, they had some issues with the nature of quantum superpositions. Specifically, they had some issues with the idea of wave function collapse with the Copenhagen interpretation proposed. They described a thought experiment, uh, which became known as the EPR paradox, and they published a paper on it in 1935. And the short version of it is that if any particle's position is unknown until it's measured, suppose for a second that two particles interacted with one another at some point, and two measurements were taken simultaneously. Then if you knew the nature of the interaction, you could predict the second measurement if you knew the first one, before you actually knew the result. The concept would later be called the quantum entanglement. Uh, they claim that the outcome of uh, a measurement can be predicted, that there must be something in the, the real world or an element of reality that, uh, that determines it. So they said, in short, that the Copenhagen interpretation was correct, but could not possibly be complete. Now, Schrodinger and Green, over the course of extended uh, correspondence with Einstein about the EBR paradox, he came up with a thought experiment you probably know him. I hope you forgive this illustration of Schrodinger's cat. Uh, it's not terribly accurate, but it's also not as morbid. Um, so Schrodinger proposed a scenario with a cat in a locked box. By the tiny bit of radioactive substance, uh, a guy would mount a mechanism that was hooked up to the guy or counter, such that if a single uh, atom of radioactive decay was detected by the guy or counter, a small flask of poison would be smashed. Um, yeah, this cat looks annoyed. You'd be annoyed too. According to him. Then, the Copenhagen interpretation implies that the cat remains both alive and dead until the state's observed. Schrodinger wasn't promoting the idea. <laughs> yeah. I love this picture. I have a cat looks just like that. Uh, Schrodinger wasn't promoting the idea of dead and alive cats as a serious possibility. Uh, instead, he intended the uh, example to illustrate the absurdity of the existing view of quantum mechanics. Years later, in Dublin uh, in 1952, he gave a lecture during which he warned the audience ahead of time what he was about to say might seem lunatic. And what he said was that when his equations seem to be describing several different histories, they're not alternatives, but all actually happen simultaneously. This is the earliest known reference to the alternative interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, that we label now as many worlds. Now, the many worlds interpretation uh, would be more formalized by a guy named Hugh Everett in 1957. He called it the relative state formulation. And the claim uh, was that it's not just tiny particles that have a wave function possibilities, but everything. 
Evans' thesis of deduction read this in its nets, but we'll simplify it afterwards. He said, since the universal validity of the state function description is asserted, one can regard the state functions themselves as the fundamental entities, and one can even consider the state function of the entire universe. In this sense, this theory can be called the theory of the universal wave function, since all of physics is presumed to follow from this function alone. Okay, that's dense. But in an early draft of his doctoral dissertation, he explained it in a way that might make a little more sense. As an analogy, one can imagine an intelligent amoeba with a very good memory. As time progresses, the amoeba is constantly splitting. Each time, the resulting amoeba is having the same memories as the parent. Our amoeba hence does not have a life line, but a life tree. I think this excerpt from uh, a letter that Einstein wrote to Schrodinger over 15 years after they'd begun corresponding about the EPR paradox is a fitting way to wrap up our crash course for the quantum mechanics. Einstein never stopped being frustrated with the ad hoc nature of wave function collapse as proposed by the Copenhagen interpretation. It felt just like a cop out, uh, as it surely did it. Everett, whose relative state formulation he claimed suggested the more real thing was the state functions themselves and not the things we observe. All of physics could then follow from that. But it's impossible to deny, oh, you don't get that distraction. It's impossible to deny the usefulness of the Copenhagen interpretation, or if you'll allow me, the Copenhagen abstraction in making sense of things. Reality or truth then becomes a question of perspective. How much reality is enough? A while ago, I told you estimates are lies. I still believe that to be true. Taken individually, estimates are wildly inaccurate. We don't know how accurate our estimates are going to be in advance, and we have no way of knowing for sure how, how long it's going to take us to finish our task until the very moment that we deliver the finished work. But the funny thing is, estimates tend to be wrong in ways that offset one another. Some easy things turn out to be hard, some hard things turn out to be easy and a pattern emerges that you can start to base larger scale predictions on. So you end up with this paradoxical result that estimates can work really, really well, so long as we can all agree that, to the ad hoc principle that they don't actually work at all. Or maybe it's more like, yeah, uh, maybe there's some objective notion of truth, but that truth, like the biggest Git repository you've ever seen, branches off into an infinite number of directions, and the state that we observe is just ahead of our current branch. <laughs> Is it any wonder then that intelligent people ask the question of whether or not we're living in a simulation? And it's not just one isolated individual here. There are all kinds of voices that are asking this question. And some seriously smart people think it's almost a certainty. But others say it's completely ridiculous. It's disturbing to some. And it's easy to dismiss this as the stuff of science fiction, or as irrelevant, since we can't yet figure out any way to prove or disprove it. But let's not forget that the 5th century BC Greek philosophers had very limited powers of observation on modern standards, and yet that didn't stop them from deriving the existence of the atom. How many of you have seen The Matrix? I expected that. I am pretty sure for anyone who hasn't, 17 years has passed the statute of limitations for spoilers, but feel free to plug your ears in history. <laughs> So, central to the Matrix's plot is this idea that most of us are living in a simulation called the Matrix. And while our real bodies are hooked up to machines generating power from artificially intelligent machine life, um, we're, uh, a few humans are free. A few humans are free and they can enter and leave the Matrix uh, at will, fighting against the machines uh, in a real world that turns out to be hellish by comparison to the one that's simulated. I want to show you one of the most memorable clips of this movie. Um, Cypher, the man on the left in this photo, was having uh, been free for nine years, having a discussion with uh, an agent of the machine named Agent Smith. Do we have a deal, Mr. Green? You know, I know this state doesn't exist. I know that when I put it in my mouth, the Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. After nine years, you know what I realize? <sighs> Ignorance is bliss. Now to be clear, the situation in the Matrix is not quite the one that's uh, posed in the simulation hypothesis. 
And that's really what makes this especially interesting to me. In the simulation hypothesis, there's not a real version of you, or depending on your perspective, the simulated version of you is the real one. What Cypher's asking for is fundamentally different. He knows the version of him that exists in the matrix isn't the real one. And he says, ignorance is bliss. He wants a deal that will plug him back in, make him forget that it's not real. He wants to make the simulated reality his reality again. Which brings us back to the point of abstraction. Now you can tell us I came to you from Ruby Land, because I'm going to talk about some feelings now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little too much right there. You're a little, you did that a little too well. <laughs> so it's been said that science is the search for truth. And lots of you said that you had computer science degrees. You spent a lot of time searching for truth. Looking for code examples, by the way, on Stack Overflow does not count. <laughs> You might say, well, no, but it's an applied science. So we're around a software engineer, an engineering discipline. That's fair. There are good cases for applying engineering principles to what we do. But even then, we've only expanded our definition from searching for truth to applying truth. For some reason, we shy away from labeling ourselves as artists. But I feel that we spend far more of our time being artists than being engineers or being scientists. And there really shouldn't be any shame. Artists move beyond searching for truth or applying truth. Uh, they express truth, and some might even go so far as to say they create new truths. And that's what we try to do with abstractions. I still believe that abstractions are by their very nature alive, that they're abstractions at all. But when we work with code, don't we strive to create things that feel somehow true? How do we do this as artists? Well, first, we do what we can to aid the suspension of disbelief. Performance artists do this all the time. Um, the lie is for your own good. It's something that is going to give you enjoyment or maybe reduce your suffering. When a magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat, you don't have to really believe he has magical powers. You just have to be able to suspend your disbelief just enough in order to enjoy the show. This just needs to go so far as to enable enjoyment. Um, it's, it's an informal contract between the audience and the artist. The audience should be left wondering, how'd that work? It does nobody any good at all if having seen a magic act, we're so convinced that magic is real that we go home and try to star some significant other than that. And also, the context in which an abstraction is framed and from where we perceive it is going to influence how truthful that abstraction feels. For instance, when you see this code, you don't assume that if I create a person struck named Ernie Miller, I've created a copy of myself. This struck represents a certain aspect of me, sure. Um, and I can count on another programmer to share that context. Earlier this year, I gave you the presentation I mentioned earlier that I was so stressed out about at a conference named Ruby on Ales. And the organizers had a surprise that they gave all the speakers. This is mine. This is me with my cat escort. Now, when I said this was me, you understood this was a portrait. This portrays an artist's perception of my physical appearance. I didn't have to tell you that. This is me too. Again, you may tell me because of my physical appearance when I was younger. Uh, you make an educated guess that I was a huge dork, and you're right on both counts. If someone says Ernie Miller to you, and you happen to know me from my Twitter feed, um, this is probably a shiny picture. But is it me? Oh no, it's a photograph. It's an abstraction that represents me. But even with the portrait, making that distinction feels a little silly, doesn't it? And that's because of a shared understanding about pictures that's been ingrained over us over the course of millennia into us. From the very first time people painted on cave walls. It's elemental. We're able to build on top of that elemental, that shared understanding of reality, uh, to express or create things that feel true. Once we believed that water, fire, earth, and wind were the elements, and everything was made from them. Now we know about atomic theory and the elements in the periodic table. We also know that those don't exist without something even more elemental, the elementary particles. And now I'm hearing that maybe they found something even smaller than that in the large hadron collider. So still, given how useful it is of its own, and the jumping complexity between the elements and elementary particles. Remember, we still don't fully understand how particles work. Um, the periodic table still remains useful. 
So how does any abstraction achieve that feeling of being true? That how does it become elemental? Well, it does so by being pervasive, persistent, and practical. Elemental abstractions are everywhere, and they have been for a long time. They may be made in even more elementary things, but they're also incredibly useful on their own, even without understanding what's underneath them. Um, modern web applications, like the ones you're probably building, are compounds of four elements. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and state. Now, you can be forgiven for mentally swapping state to SQL, but really it encompasses whatever gives the actions in your application their impact on the system. Now, there was a long time during which I had these sort of partially formed feelings about certain abstractions that I struggled to explain. As developers, we tend to talk about things like leaky abstractions or violations of the principle of least astonishment. But those words are just proxies for what we're really feeling. In the first case, our suspension of disbelief has been broken because we were forced to understand how things work behind the scenes. And in the second, we already had context for how things work, and the abstraction broke, uh, broke a reasonable expectation that we had based on that context. And that's what it dawned on. There was a reason I had such strong feelings about these abstractions. I was a naive young Rails developer, weren't we all? Uh, attracted to shiny things. And they lured me in with promises of a better world. They told me they were lying to me for my own good, but it turns out that it only ended in heartbreak because they were trying to replace something that was elemental. How many of you are familiar with Camel? Obviously. When Yaml came along, I took one look and I said, yes, please, it looks so clean, uh, it looks so elegant. Uh, but while Yaml will generate valid HTML, valid HTML is not valid Yaml. Don't even try it. The same thing with sets. Look how pretty. It's got variables, it's got nesting, it's got mixins. These are things CSS should have had from the get-go. Sign me up for that. But once again, a valid CSS is not valid sets. Forget you ever use CSS. And with CoffeeScript, ooh, pretty. I hated JavaScript. And this, if I split it, almost looks like Ruby, and I love Ruby. You're probably seeing a bit of a pattern there. All of these things just have to stand in for something that we just can't escape. When we debug our applications in the browser, they are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. No amount of source mapping changes that reality. So we've got these abstractions that try to stand in for something that's more elemental, but ask us to forget what we already know about those, those elements, even though the browser just can't forget it. There's got to be a better option. Well, what's a better abstraction over top of HTML? In my opinion, embedded Elixir gets this right. A plain old HTML file is totally valid uh, embedded Elixir. It's a little boring, but it's totally valid. You only trigger a mixture interpretation when you ask for it with special tags that aren't valid HTML tags. And that part's important. You're extending, you're not modifying. SCSS uh, gives you all the good stuff in sets as a superset of CSS. And the same thing is true for ES6, ES6 2015, whatever the heck they're calling it this month. It extends what you already know to be true about JavaScript, so it feels more honest. But that's only three of the elements. What about state? You might remember I was mildly stressed out by having agreed to do a talk in an eight-week time frame without a working application. I had punted on a lot of things that helped me get the proof of concept ready. Stuff like loading a real slide deck, uh, being able to have speaker notes, and you know, actually rendering reasonably attractive slides, and they had to be written in markdown. But the application continued to be a breeze to build. I got the basic center UI laid out, uh, complete slide preview notes, the attendee connection info, and then I got the slide loading and loading functionality built uh, out of the next week or so. And I got it rendering properly for attendees on desktop and mobile browsers too. Uh, to tell the truth, the hardest thing about building this application was getting the CSS to play nicely. The fact is you probably can't tell the difference between these two screenshots is a testament to my stubbornness. Then as I started building the talk, it was like, you know, it sure would be nice to read this voting functionality for something more freeform, non-branching votes, and it would turn out to be something I could throw together in a hack -in. Oh, and sometimes, you know, images should have captions, and it'd be nice if the markdown rendering could handle that. 
And when I use images, I need a way to attribute the author. And I like to use the occasional quote slide. Wouldn't it be great if that just worked and threw block quotes in the, in the markdown? And that was building a part of the talk to discuss distractions. And I was thinking about how distracting chat applications can be. And hey, everyone's already connected on the same server, so why not make a slide that is literally a standalone chat application for all of the attendees in the game to be distracted by during that part of the talk? I was later told, <laughs> I was later told by someone who attended this talk that it was the most beautifully over-engineered talk they'd ever seen. <laughs> and I took that as a compliment. I mean, after all, it's a pleasure to build, so why not? I am not overstating when I say that I had more fun, more joy when building this application than anything I've built in the past decade. For the most part, it didn't feel like building a web application. It just felt like building an application. And it felt like using an application. And I think that's because I managed to avoid dealing with the pain that's caused by one of the biggest lies that we've been told that we've been living with for so long it started to feel true. Here's the lie. Building a stateful application on the back of a stateless protocol is a totally reasonable plan. Oh, you can totally fake it. We've spent decades figuring out ways to fake it. But the fact is, traditional server-rendered applications are a huge, huge hack, and it's incredible that they even work out, let alone just what they do. I mentioned before that I got into programming through systems administration. Now, as a sysadmin, I would set up an SSH server that poured processes for every connection I made. Made those processes, uh, they connected to a shell. Uh, they piped messages back and forth. They, those messages might launch other processes to manage the server. Um, I used those processes to configure XINFP, a process whose sole job it was to launch other processes on demand. And to configure a supervisor process to restart crash processes and notify admins. And never not once did I ever have to remind an already running process, process what its state was. I mean, it sounds familiar. The elemental abstraction for state is a process. It's as though Erlang, by extension Elixir, said, you know what, we can get away from dealing with processes, so let's just call it what it is, try to make it as lightweight and honest as possible in abstraction. That's some serious judo stuff right there. And I think that's why I found this application such a joy to build. Pretty much everything in the app came down to processes and messages. For the moment, the React application connected to the web socket. It was just out of the process of the system, although it communicated via a socket. The socket process knew whether the person was an attendee or a center. Messages from Phoenix that were dispatched as actions to React. Uh, and those are basically just messages themselves, and vice versa. And since the UI was just the result of a function applied to the current application state, everything just felt so honest. That was a lot of feelings, I know, a lot of rubies. So all abstractions may be wise, but the good ones help us suspend disbelief and behave so they're true. Don't miss this. The, the real power of an abstraction lies in its ability to affect our perspective on things, uh, which in turn frees our minds to consider new possibilities. Every day, every line of code that you write has the opportunity to create this kind of change in the people who use it. And there's something truly special about an honest abstraction like this, but I can't finish up, and I know it looks like we're running over if we started right now, I probably don't do that. Um, I can't overstate how much uh, impact this has had on my joy working with Elixir and Phoenix. But there's something more as well. I think this honesty has infected the Elixir community in a good way. My very first day learning Elixir, I tweeted about it. And Jose responded with happiness and an offer to help if I had questions. And I actually took him up on it a few days later. And it turns out it wasn't just an empty offer, he wasn't just being nice. He was honestly willing to help. He took time out of his day to take this news code and look at it and give me an honest and extremely helpful bit of feedback on it. Same thing happened when I started using Phoenix for my presentation application. Chris offered to help me for a talk that I was working on, and even after I explained that the talk wasn't actually about Phoenix, but just using Phoenix, he told me his offer still stood. I want you to understand this has nothing to do with who I am. People know me from the Ruby community, but this isn't that. This has to do with who they are. They're kind. And that brings me to the other key value I see in this community. Do a quick search on nice versus kind, and you're going to see that kindness goes beyond being nice. People can say and do nice things for all sorts of reasons, uh, including conflict avoidance, but people are kind because of who they are. And because it's rooted in their identity, there's honesty and strength there, and a willingness to set some good boundaries. There's a saying in the Ruby community, Minaswan. 
It's an acronym that stands for Matt's is nice and so we are nice. I've always liked this, and to be clear, I don't think, I don't really know Matt's well, but I, I think he's probably kind as well as nice. But with this notion of kindness in mind, I really, really want to make this a thing. Chica Swan. Jose is kind, and so we are kind. I'm about to say, say it with me. Chica Swan. Yeah, it's nice. I like it. It's kind. Uh, but seriously, I've always found that communities with a media that have a dictator for life tend to reflect the best and the worst of that person's traits. That's why I'm so happy to see that both the Elixir and the Phoenix communities have media fellows with traits that are worth reflecting. It's true, I do pick the technology based on what it makes me feel like cheating, but I stick around in a community. Uh, I stick around for the community. And this community promises to be one for it to stick around for. Thank you.